This is the story of how U.S. foreign policy has affected the representation of Latino people over the last 90 years. Hello, and welcome back to the genealogy of the pop divas. In today's episode, we're going to explore the fascinating life of Carmen Miranda. <laughs> To understand the way in which Latino people are being currently represented in the media, we have to go back around 90 years to the beginning of the Roosevelt administration. In my previous video about the jazz era, we explored the ways in which the Roosevelt administration dealt with the Great Depression internally with a set of economic policies known as the New Deal. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the ways in which they dealt with foreign policy issues. In an effort to denounce the previous military, cultural, and economic interventions that the United States had been involved in in the Americas, President Roosevelt, in his inaugural address of March 4th, 1933, presented the Good Neighbor Policy. This policy, as its name refers to, meant that the United States was going to be a pleasant country to be around. It also meant that they wanted to create better relationships with other countries. The ramifications of this policy also meant that there was a government interest in creating better representation for Latin Americans, particularly in Hollywood. It is very important to note that Hollywood and the government was very, very tight at this point. So much so that films and moving pictures were not protected under the First Amendment. They were considered to be so effective in disseminating propaganda that they felt that it was a tool of war. And this was the case worldwide. In Italy, for example, Mussolini was creating the first film school in the Western world, El Centro Experimentale de Cinematografia. And the same was happening in Russia. And so countries around the world knew the film was a powerful tool in the propagation of ideologies. At this point, during World War II, the United States established the Office of War Information, OWI, to regulate content and produce propaganda materials. On the other hand, the Office of Inter-American Affairs, OIA, was created to counter German and Italian's influence in the Americas and to improve the image of the U.S. in Latin America. However, if you're familiar with U.S. history, you will know that the good neighbor policy didn't last too long. In fact, Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman, completely went the other way with his Truman Doctrine, in which he said there was a moral and political imperative to intervene in every single country in the world, particularly in Latin America, to stop the spread of communism. But let's not get ahead just yet, because we will talk about this in our next episode about the 1950s. So by now you might be asking, how is Carmen Miranda related to all of this? It was decided, as has been done in many cases in history, that a woman will be the best embodiment for the nation. In this case, it wasn't one nation, it was many nations lumped into just one potential ideal nation, Latin America. Obviously, this was a huge problem because Latin America is ethnically, culturally, and linguistically very diverse. However, there was the sense that you could portray all of these one nation, one country, by the body of Carmen Miranda. And I want to take a moment here because as I reflect, I think this is one of the reasons why it is so hard for so many people in the United States and the global north to understand the nuances and the difference between different countries like Mexico or Colombia. It has been a recurrent image in the mass media that it is in fact just one nation. This also reflects on the fact that it is so hard for so many Latino, Latina, Latinx people to fit into a box and to think about, okay, who am I in reference to, for example, US mainstream culture, because it was a manufactured culture. Latinidad or Latin American didn't really have any weight at that point beyond being a construction by the U.S. government and Hollywood. So I think it's really important when you think about identities that have come to mean so much to people to understand where do they come from? Because sometimes it is really hard for people in the real world to identify and to fit into categories that were honestly just created because of economic or political interests. So who was Carmen Miranda? Carmen Miranda, born Maria do Carmo Miranda da Cunha, was a Brazilian singer, dancer, and actress. She was born in February 9, 1909 in Portugal. However, her family migrated to Brazil when she was just an infant, and she grew up in the vibrant city 
of Rio de Janeiro. In the 1920s, Carmen Miranda's popularity soared in Brazil. She combined traditional Brazilian outfits with glamorous accessories, creating a unique and eye-catching image. In 1939, Carmen Miranda caught the attention of Broadway producer Lee Schubert, who invited her to perform in New York City. This opportunity marked the beginning of her international career. She soon signed a contract with 20th Century Fox and made her Hollywood film debut in the movie Downtown Argentine Way in 1914. Her distinctive costumes, elaborate headdresses adorned with fruit, and her captivating performances quickly made her a sensation in the world. Throughout the 1940s, Corbin Miranda starred in a series of highly successful musicals, including That Night in Rio, The Guns All Here, and Copacabana. She gained the moniker The Brazilian Bombshell and became one of Hollywood's highest paid actresses during that era. <laughs> So there are three main reasons why Carmen Miranda was chosen as the face of the good neighbor policy. Number one, she was Brazilian. Even though the good neighbor policy was presented in good faith as an effort to become a better neighbor, it was not so the case. Actually, it was motivated by economic and political interests. Number one, the US was dealing with the effects of the Great Depression at the beginning of the 30s. And by the end of the decade, the United States was already involved in one of the biggest wars in the world. World War II. So they needed to create new markets, particularly for films, because at the time when Carmen Miranda started in Hollywood by the 40s, Hollywood could not send films to Germany, Italy, and many other parts of Europe. So the film industry needed to create a new market, and that market was down south. So even though a lot of people think that Latin America was backwards, undeveloped, and completely poor, Brazil was actually the strongest market in Latin America. The country experienced significant industrialization and modernization, driven by sectors like agriculture, manufacturing, and mining. This economic strength made Brazil an attractive market for the American films, and Carmen Miranda as a Brazilian became the visible face of representing Latin America during that time. Number two, she was ethnically European. So at the time, it was very, very important that whoever was going to represent Latin America was white presenting. And it was not only because of the US mainstream market or Hollywood, it was also because countries in Latin America wanted to be portrayed as white and more developed. This was particularly true in countries like Argentina and Brazil, which during the 1800s had promoted the migration of European settlers into their countries. These countries were also highly engaged in the process of whitening the population, meaning bringing more people who were of European descent into the country to populate it with people who look white. Brazil implemented migration policies to attract Europeans. The government offered incentives such as land grants, financial assistance, and employment opportunities to entice people to migrate. Agreements with European governments simplified the visa process and provided financial aid, contributing to the rise of European migration into the region. And it was not only during the 1800s, but actually right after World War II, Brazil also presented the same policies trying to entice people fleeing the war to come into Brazil and populate it. So everyone involved was interested that the person who was going to represent the good neighbor policy was going to be white. Number three, it was very easy for Carmen Miranda to become the face of the good neighbor policy because she fit into standing stereotypes of who Latina women were. She had a strong accent, her outfits were colorful, and the stereotypes have been connected to people of color all around the world. If we think about Josephine Baker and we talked about her banana skirt, now we have with Carmen Miranda the tutti frutti and the image of fruit and food to be connected to people of color has been a long-standing tradition, particularly because people in those countries are described as you would food. For example, when Latino people are described, the first thing that people say are spicy or hot or caliente, which are things that are meant to describe food. And also again, to think about the practices in which food, particularly bananas, were coming into the United States. We also need to think about the violence and the force that was used to produce certain products around the world, like bananas, and the companies, particularly American and Canadian companies, that were producing bananas in South America at the time. So you know this is a space where we celebrate divas, and I want to give Carmen Miranda a generous reading of who she was. As I said before, Carmen Miranda was one of the first people to introduce Latin rhythms into the U.S. market. She incorporated elements of Brazilian rhythms, melodies, and instrumentation. 
She created a fusion that appealed to both Latin American and U.S. audiences. One notable aspect of Miranda's music was her skill use of syncopation. Syncopation is a rhythmic technique commonly found in Afro-Brazilian music, which involves highlighting weak beats or off beats, creating a lively and infectious rhythmic feel. This rhythmic complexity contributed to the captivating nature of her performances, establishing her as a distinctive sound in the 1940s. Now let's talk about her fashion. Bayana outfit included a head wrap, an open midriff, colorful garments, beads, and high platform heels. And in terms of her outfit, it is also important to historicize where it comes from. So the Bayana outfit comes from the region of Bahia, which is populated mainly by Afro-Brazilians. Because of internal migration, people from Bahia move into bigger cities like Rio or Sao Paulo, and historically, they sold fruit on the streets. And that's where Carmen Miranda got her inspiration. So it is really important to think about the ways in which she was, in effect, portraying Afro-Brazilian culture, but it was still in the body of someone who was of European descent. And again, I want to think about how it became really common for people to dress up as Carmen Miranda, particularly white men. And this is not just Carmen Miranda, we've seen it with people like Jennifer Lopez after she wore the infamous green Versace dress. People also start dressing up like her. And I think it speaks to the ways in which fashion and an image becomes a commodity. And lastly, I want to talk about representation in film. Carmen Miranda was one of the first Latina actresses to be signed by one of the big studios. And we're going to talk a little bit more in our next episode about Dina Horn and the studio system and the star system. But for now, I want to think about the fact that she did open to a degree door for other people to enter the industry. In fact, cultural critics like Soraya Nadia McDonald have said that people like Sofia Vergara have picked up where Carmen Miranda left, and she has utilized some of the same techniques that Carmen Miranda used back in the 40s to become famous again. And again, I don't want to criticize anyone, and I don't want to criticize Sofia Vergara or Carmen Miranda because they were actually a part of a system that was producing culture, and the problem was not that Carmen Miranda was there, the problem is that she was the only one. She was the only representation that we had. And going back to the outfit, it is fascinating how it stayed in people's minds. Here we have Gloria Stefan talking to Vogue about her infamous 1988 performance at the VMAs. So, y me acuerdo que querían algo muy latino. Y al principio querían convencerme a ponerme fruta en la cabeza. Uh -uh. Le dije, esperen un momentico, esa es Carmen Miranda, ella es brasilera. But still, the fact that to make Latinidad understandable and palatable to the American public, you need to put fruit on your head. It is a testament to the power that images and sound has had in people's minds. And again, because this is a space where I uplift and celebrate these women, I don't want to walk away criticizing Carmen Miranda because at a personal level, she had a very high price to pay. She had a heart attack by the age of 46, and it's reported that she was dealing with a lot of depression, drug abuse, and abusive relationships. So I can only imagine what it was for her to be the face of a full movement to represent a whole continent. I don't think she wanted to do it herself. And still, she was a pioneer. She entered spaces where Latina people had never been allowed to. And she, in fact, created the space for other Latinas to be a part of the industry after her. So the takeaway message is that even though progress has been made, we're still fighting to see a multiplicity of figures that can represent the complexity of Latinidad and the complexity of what it is to be Latina. Now we can understand how people like Jennifer Lopez, Selena, Shakira were reshaping and recreating long-standing stereotypes about who Latinas are. Carmen Miranda was our first Latino figure, but ahead of us we have people like Celia Cruz and Rita Moreno, who broke even more barriers for Afro-Latina and Puerto Rican women in the country. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I'm sending you much love and happiness into your life. Bye.